In 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse number 7, we learn that Abraham is called the friend of God. And in Romans 4, 16, the father of the faithful. We read in uh, Romans chapter 4 and verse 3, and I'll couple with that Paul's writing to Galatians in Galatians 3, 6, and 9, these good words of admonition. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God. Man was counted unto him for righteousness. Then, as Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So then they that are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Keeping in mind these words are a part of the New Testament, the last verses I gave you. They let us know how much we have going for us as Christians. And a person that is not a Christian does not have these things. They stand in store for them if they would but humbly receive the message of salvation. Comply with its terms of pardon and live according to the truth. So Abraham's faith was accounted or imputed unto him for righteousness. And they that are of faith are blessed with him. The gospel system is a system of faith. Thus our compliance with the terms of pardon in becoming a Christian and in living the Christian life proclaims our faith, our belief, our trust, our confidence in God and God's words. Again, this most simple definition of faith that I can think of is taking God at his word. And when you think of Abraham, that's exactly what he did. Abraham made many mistakes in a lot of ways. But every single solitary time God told him to do something, he never gainsayed. He never spoke against it. He never tried to weasel out of it. He just acted. And thus, we need to hold that before our spiritual eyes to say, is that the kind of faith I have? Because that's what Paul Ben's inspiration said concerning Christians who are faithful when it comes to Abraham. Now, we know from the study of the scriptures and the right division of the word, 2 Timothy 2.15, that there are different kinds of faith that are revealed in the scriptures. Let me say again, there are different kinds of faith. In Matthew 8.10, we learn there is a great faith faith. But in Matthew 8 verse 26, we see that there is one that had little faith. If you go over to the Hebrews epistle, chapter 10 and verse 39, we see of saving faith. And then in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 14, there is vain faith, that is, their belief or trust was pointless or empty. And in James 2.26, there is a dead faith. We also see that there were those who had denied the faith, and their faith is used because it is so integral, fundamental, and a basic part in the foundation of godliness to stand for the whole New Testament system, the gospel system, to save us. And so we see some had denied the faith. Some had departed from the faith. And there were still others, uh, Paul said, had cast off their first faith. 1 Timothy 4, 1, chapter 5, verse 8. And later in that same chapter, verse 12. And then in chapter 6, verse 10 where you have those terms referred to in the way faith is used there. So it isn't enough to have faith in the sense that many religious people 
use the expression. And I would dare say if we stop the lesson right here with some people and the lack of knowledge they have of the Bible and therefore of these different kinds of faith, that they would be greatly enlightened just to know that because people don't spend time with the Bible. The whole denominational world is noted for its lip service to the Bible. And beyond that, the wrong division of the word. And so we need to understand if we would be God's people in the true sense of the word Christians, we must rightly divide the word and we must make sure that we have the kind of faith that is not dead, that is not vain, that we have not cast off our faith and so on. But we do see that Abraham, the father of the faithful, is his picture of inspiration in the New Testament that Abraham's faith was a blessed faith. The question I would ask myself is, David Brown, is your faith in the Christian dispensation as a member of the church, is it comparable to the faith of Abraham? Because God held that up as singular in the kind of faith everybody has that is a friend of God. So I want us to examine his faith for a moment and to examine ourselves in the light of it as we look at the kind, let me understand that word, uh, underscore that word, kind of faith that Abraham had. I said earlier that the simplest definition of faith is taking God at his word. Well, when you look at Abraham, that's exactly what he did. He just simply, if it was God speaking to him, revealing an obligation that he had to God, he just did it. No questioning. He just did it. There's no why. He knew it was from God. It pertained to him, and he did it. So Abraham believed what God told him. Now, in the true sense of the word belief, it carries with it the idea of compliance with God's will. When the Scripture states, and Abraham believed God, there's a lot more revealed about Abraham's faith than we may realize. So it isn't that Abraham simply believed in the existence of God. It says he believed that God. He believed God. So when God told him something, Abraham accepted it. Abraham believed it. And in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we remember that God told Abraham to leave his home. Go to a land that I will show you. He didn't say, now leave your home and I want you to go up here and take a left and travel 300 miles this way and, and here when you get to this point on this day, you'll be where I'm sure. He didn't say that. He just said, leave your home and go to a land that I will show you. So then he said, when you get there, and Abraham in his mind says, wherever that is, then God says, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee. He goes ahead to say, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So that little simple statement, and it is simple. Abraham believed God. Says so much about that individual and his trust in God and taking God at his word. There's the first thing we drive a peg down here as we view our own faith. Is that our faith? Now, it may be easy to say, well, he didn't know where he was going and God just get up and leave home. I, I know this is not the case with a lot of people when they leave the home they grew up in. And maybe I was abnormal, but I hated to leave home. I despised it. I don't even think I was really mature enough when I left home to leave home. I enjoyed home. I enjoyed the security. I enjoyed being there. And I may be wrong because I can't know what would happen, but I really think if I'd never became a preacher that I would have ever left where I grew up. Now, we don't know those things. I certainly don't. But I know the disposition of mind I had 
very early on out of high school and a few years thereafter. So for somebody to tell me, get up and leave, that wasn't even easy for me when I knew how to get up and leave, <laughs> when it was time to get up and leave and go places. So that means that where we're, where we're located, where we grew up, where we have a familiarity, where things are going and we're used to it and it's commonplace to us, there's no uncertainties as at least we're not aware of it because of what home is supplied for us and the securities of it. We, um, we like things comfortable. You, you like, frankly, we all like routines. We like being where things are. You know, you like knowing where the nearest Walmart is. <laughs> so we like that. Well, we may think that didn't make anything difference to Abraham, but when you think of the modes of travel, the way the world was at that time, that was something else. Get up and leave. And uh, I'll show you later, now I will make of you a great nation. So that was amazing that he took God at God's word and acted not knowing where he was going. Now after Isaac, who's called the child of promise, was born, we see that Abraham begins to grow a little more in faith. And that's another point I want you to know. Abraham grew in faith. Abraham grew in his trust of God. He was willing there, not knowing whether he went to go because he knew God told him to. But nevertheless, Abraham's faith grew and it's further revealed. God had said, In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Genesis 21, 12. But then what happens? After quite a few years with Isaac, I, uh, Abraham is commanded of God, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and offer him as a burnt offering. Genesis 22 and verse 2. Now when it comes to enjoying home and not wanting to leave that's one thing to be told leave and takes God at his word and he leaves but now this is a big step in his trust in God his taking God at his word because Abraham knew that it was through Isaac that all these promises are going to be performed and now God says take your son your only son Isaac and offer him a burnt offering there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. The Hebrews writer will let us know more about that. We'll read in just a moment. But nevertheless, what was his trust, his confidence in God? He took him at his word. Now his faith is put to the test. Because in other situations, it was a sin for those people to offer up human sacrifice. Well, then what made this thing right? Who said it? That's what made it right. This tested Abraham's faith, trust, belief in God. And he did it for one reason and one reason only. God commanded him to do it. And he knew that God commanded him to do it. So what kind of faith did Abraham have? Well, let's go to Hebrews 11. New Testament, Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. By faith, now watch, here's what it is. By faith, when his faith was tried, when it was put to the test, how strong is your faith in God? How far will you go in taking God at his word? He offered up Isaac. Now when you read the whole story, you know he, God held him back from actually taking Isaac's life. But when you read the account in Genesis, it's, he had the knife ready to kill the boy. However he had it, he was ready to kill him. In his heart, that boy was dead. He had offered him sacrifice. And why? Because he took God in his word. So we go ahead and read Hebrews writer, and he says, And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now that was a type, a shadow, of what would happen with our Heavenly Father offering up Christ. 
In fact, Isaac was innocent of anything. He didn't deserve to die. So we see, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting. Here's what Abraham thought. And you know you have to get all the way over the New Testament before you know what Abraham thought. Abraham thought that God was able to raise him up even from the ashes or the dead. That's how he reigns out his mind, but it didn't have to go that far. But it lets us peer into the mind of faithful Abraham. God said through Isaac, thy seed shall be called, I'll perform all these promises through him. Now you take him and offer him a burnt offering to me. And he says, well, he's able to do that. Do what? Raise him from the dead. God knows what he's doing. But you know, there can be things happen in our lives that test our faith in what we know the Bible says we ought to be doing. This is going to happen. It's the way it works in preparing our souls for eternity. There has to be a time when we must choose and reject things very important to us and embrace the things God told us to do because we can have both of them at the same time. So this is the kind of faith that God approves. And I have to ask myself a question every time I study this or recall it. Is that, is that my faith? Is that my trust in God? Well, I take God at his word as Abraham did, even when things don't look right. Even when it looks like God's contradicting himself. Because God being who God is, he doesn't contradict himself. See, God is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. If he says something, the Bible says he cannot lie. It's not in his very makeup as deity to lie. He's the source of all truth. He's light. All things contrary to him is darkness. This lets us know what Abraham had in his mind. God's able to reconcile all these things. God's able to put them together. There are things that happen to us through life and they seem so contradictory. They can seem like that it's just too much. But when we know that we know that we know God's will, then God's able to reconcile all these things. He knew all these things before they ever came into existence and before we ever lived. He knew Abraham before Abraham was born. And so now... Life is designed for Abraham to see his own growth and development. To see his own development of a stronger faith. Have you ever prayed for a stronger faith? I think we all have. But we must let God work in the way God works, in the way he made us in this world. And for the reason he made this world and how it functions. And the way he leads men through his word that we might make the right choices even when things don't seem right. Because when we know that we know the Bible and we're doing it, even though it seems like some things just don't make sense, that's not up for us to make those decisions. The main thing is, did God tell me to act in this way? Or did he tell me to leave some things alone? Well, it looks like that doesn't work, but it does. Now you can see more, if somebody was standing there not believing in God and was to be there when Abraham was told that through thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed and I will make of thee a great nation. Then he's there all of a sudden and he hears God say, Take thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and offer him a burnt offering. So what? Have you lost your marbles? And do you remember what Paul had to say then? That the foolish things of the world confound the wise. All Abraham had to know was just take God at his word. And it'll work. Because God controls all things. He knows what he's doing. So without doubt, without questioning, he accepted fully what God told him to do. No wonder then he is called the faithful Abraham and as Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 4 and verse 20 he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith 
giving glory to God. Now that comment is made in the context of where God had told him, you and Sarah will have a son. Because they were long past childbearing age. Frankly, that just says, by believing God, taking him at his word, that you're going to be a father of a child through Sarah, that gave them the wherewithal to engage in the procreative act. We don't think about that that often. That's exactly what that says. And it was all because I know God said so, thus it can be done. So Abraham, by faith, did what God told him to. Now the kind of faith God blesses is described then in, again, the New Testament. Hebrews 11 and verse number 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, to please Him. For he that cometh to God must, there's the imperative, must believe that He is. That's a starting point. He didn't stop there, does he? And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently, your whole heart's in it, all your efforts are in it, that diligently seek him. So it's not a matter of only believing that God is. It has to start there to prove the existence of God. But we must also believe he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, that's the kind of faith Abraham had. God told him to leave, as we said, Ur of the Chaldees. And later he told him to leave Haran up at the northwest part of the land between the rivers, Mesopotamia. And the scripture says in Hebrews 11, 8, by faith, now remember faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should have to receive for inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. Again, that's Hebrews 11, 8. Well, that same kind of faith we've already talked about was there in him when he was told to offer Isaac. That's discussed in the New Testament in the same chapter which is a great chapter on the faithful worthies of the Old Testament Hebrews 11 17 through 19 by faith Abraham obeyed think about it for a minute doesn't it sound rather strange if it were to read this way by faith in God Abraham disobeyed him how does that work that doesn't make sense it's absurd but it was by faith, the scripture says, that Abraham obeyed God. And that's really what the faith of Abraham is all about. Trust God enough to take him at his word and to do what he said the way he said it for the reason he said it, to obey him. Now, if you go back in the history of mankind, you'll see that God's always approved, always, always approved and blessed man. When, as the song says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I do not know how people who say, well, you don't have to obey him, but if you just acknowledge Christ as your Savior and ask him to come into your heart, that's fine. How do they sing that song? Trust and obey. When does a person's trust in God and God's word and all that that means save a person? in disobedience or in obedience. So when man refused to obey God, what happened? If there's any message, there are many, many, many that come down to us from the Old Testament. Well, when God refused, or rather when man refused to obey God, what happened? God rejected him. But you don't have to obey God to be acceptable to God. But the whole Old Testament says when man re refused to obey God, God didn't accept him in that disobedience, but he rejected him. So the truth is simple. It's been quoted so often. The, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. At the end there are the ways of death. And another in Jeremiah 10, 23, the way of man is not in himself. It is not in, that, in man that walketh to direct his steps. There are 
I wouldn't know how many thousands, millions, I guess, people today say that God's my heavenly Father, the Bible's the Word of God, Jesus is my Savior. But I think this, and I think that, and I have this feeling about that, and don't take that away from me. Well, you never find anything taught like that in the Bible as a way to measure whether you're acceptable to God or not. Because there is a way that seems right. Well, how do you know what's right? Not that it seems right. How do you know what's right? Well, without the Bible, you don't. So when it comes to the Scriptures, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, which means spiritually complete, thoroughly or thoroughly furnished in every good work. So unless we believe God, not just believe in God, but believe the God in which we believe, we'll not allow him to direct our lives. And you can say Jesus Christ is the Son of God and Savior of the world all day long, but if you don't let him have his way with you, you're lost. And you'll go into an eternal hell believing that Christ is the Son of God because you wouldn't let him have his way with you. And that implies a free moral agency on your part. I can choose to let this God whom I say is God have his way with me, or I can know he's God and I can reject him. And if we don't allow that, that is to believe in God, take him at his word, then we can't be saved. So Jesus is still asking those who claim to follow him as a son of God, why call you me Lord, Lord? And you know the rest of it. I can stop there. And do not the things which I say. Luke 6, 46. Now ask that question of Abraham. Well, he didn't, did he? When he acknowledged him as God, he obeyed him. He did the things God told him to do. So Abraham believed God. And because of that kind of faith, he obeyed him. He didn't disobey him. That's the kind of faith that's always blessed people. It's the kind of faith that will bless you today. Several times in the scriptures, the statement is found, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned or imputed unto him for righteousness. That's found over in Genesis 15, 6 for the first time around. But inspiration had Paul write it, to the church at Rome is a part of the New Testament in Romans chapter 4 and verse 3. It was again written by Paul to the Galatian churches, Galatians 3 and verse 6. And James even used that in his great discussion on saving faith in James 2 and verse 23. Now that word that is translated reckon or imputed in Romans 4 and 4 is to count in verse 3 as accounted or in Galatians 3 6 imputed or as I've already referred you to James 2 23 the same is the case now Thayer's Greek English lexicon defines it as to reckon count compute to take into account to make account of to lay to one's charge or to make equivalent to something it's really in Greek an accounting term for you accountants in here <laughs> in other words Abraham was considered to be righteous why because of his faith but how was faith created in Abraham by God by Abraham's will to take God at his word his faith was put on his account with God as the equivalent of righteousness to Abraham's account with God. Oh, I have an account, bank. You have an account problem, bank. You also have an account with God. Now what's he recording on that account? Well, I know what he did with Abraham. I know how he's recorded in the scriptures. And Abraham accepted God's word and complied with it. It was written down for his benefit, his account. 
on the ledger of God. It's also in this sense that the word is used in Romans 4 where Paul is discussing these things. And the scripture reads, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Sometimes it says imputed. Then he went ahead to say, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. I never read that passage. Whether I'm preaching it now, how many times I read it. I want to say, who is that man? Who is the man to whom the Lord will not reckon sin to his charge? He's the faithful man. He's like Abraham. He takes God at his word. And therefore, it, that is his faith, was imputed to him for righteousness. Verses 3, 8, and 22. Now the apostle, that's Paul, in writing the church's Galatia, in Galatia chapter 3 and verse 9, said then this. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Now back to Romans. It's really in both cases here they're addressing much the same topic. Romans 4, 23 through 24. Speaking of Abraham, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him or reckoned to him or accounted to him. But who was it really written for? Just to end up with Abraham? No. What does he say? But for us also, to whom it shall be reckoned or imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. What is that saying? Do you realize all of this material from the Old Testament that actually happened in time and space or history to real people that God had in his mind? This is going to help them when Christ comes. And how he's going to save them through a system of faith. To understand the kind of faith they've got to have in order to be saved. I'll already give them an example in Abraham who took God as word. Thus, he's the father of the faithful. So then two verses following this, we're told he was justified by faith. And we are justified by faith. If we have the faith of Abraham. As the blessing was his through his faithful obedience, so the blessing is ours. As our faith can be accounted for righteousness, then so it is that we learn the same thing was happening with Abraham. That's the reason Paul, in dealing with the Judaizing teachers, Jews who said, yes, Jesus is the Messiah, we obeyed him, we become Christians. But now Gentiles have got to be circumcised, keep the law, if they're going to be saved. Paul's argument is, don't you claim Abraham? Well, yes, they did. They'd be offended greatly if they didn't look to Abraham as the father fleshly to them. But Abraham never was other law, was he? And he's the one that received the mark of circumcision because of faithful activities. Not before he was faithful, but because of faithfulness. All these things are imputed to him for righteousness. So that faith will be imputed to us for righteousness when we take Christ at his words and submit to him without gainsaying. Remember, that's the faith of Abraham, the obedient faith. Doesn't that make James 2 make a lot more sense when you realize what's discussed there? All this is a commentary on what James is talking about in James 2. So we must have the faith of Abraham. We must trust and obey. Then it's imputed to us for righteousness. And we stand with all our imperfections, righteous before God. Not by any works of righteousness, which we did, but we took God at his word as it's presented in the gospel of Christ, God's power to save us, Romans 1.16. And in faith, we serve God and know that we stand righteous before him. If you'll understand this, you'll understand more what John's writing, 1 John. How do we know that? How do we know this? Well, again, he says, let's bring Abraham back to the witness stand. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? James writes. When he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar... 
Now watch how he asked them to join in with him. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? And by works was faith made perfect. When a person says, you don't have to do anything in order to be saved by Jesus Christ. They're saying you can be saved by an imperfect faith. Because the Holy Spirit said, if that makes anybody any difference, through the inspired Luke in the New Testament of Jesus Christ, which is the standard of which anybody knows anything about Christianity, the ultimate final standard of which there's no greater, he says your faith can't be made perfect unless you comply with the will of God. Who's the best example of that as far as human beings are concerned? Abraham. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. James 2, 21 through 23. Now let's sum this up as in closing the lesson. How do I know I stand righteous before God that he doesn't hold any sins against me anymore? I took God at his word. Can you know whether you took God at his word? Yes. He made you in such a way as you could know. But he also, of course, gave you and giving you that free moral agency. He said, yeah, I know that's what the Bible says, but you can say that. And go right on your way, but you won't walk in the steps of faithful Abraham, and you'll still be in your sins. And no righteousness will be reckoned in God's ledger in heaven for you because you're not covered by the blood of Christ. That begins, you see, where our faith is tested in becoming a Christian. Every form of entering some religion that claims Christ as Savior requires learning something, believing in something, turning from one way to follow whatever that way that religion teaches, and a willingness to publicly declare the same. Where's the problem? It's in baptism. There's where people are rising up. The devil must be happy as he can be and say, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Baptism is not for the remission of sins. I'll even let you go so far as saying, yeah, you can be baptized. You can be buried in water. As long as you think you were saved the moment you believe without any other acts of obedience, I, the devil say, I'll let you believe that. He doesn't have to get you off too much to get you off. <laughs> well, who's going to have their sins remembered against them no more, the sins that originally separated from them from God to become a Christian. You must get rid of those. It's when your faith's tested. Well, I can't see how being punched beneath water is going to save me. How does that have anything to do with God saving me? I believe God can save me any way he wants to. But the question is, how does he want to and how has he said he would? And Romans 6 makes it clear. He's addressing people who took Christ at their word. They became Christians. And they were buried with the Lord in baptism. And again, how many times have we read it and quoted it in Romans 6, 17, and 18? But God be thanked that you were, past tense, used to be, not anymore, the service of sin. But you've obeyed from the heart. What? That form of doctrine, that pattern of teaching which was delivered to you. When is the then you were made free from sin? When you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. What was the form of doctrine? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, Romans 6, 3, and 4. That's what Paul said when he wrote the Christians in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That's the gospel he said you heard, believed, and obeyed. Same gospel he preached to the Romans. Just further explanation on it in Romans 6. In reminding them of what they did when they became Christians to motivate them to greater faithful service in the church. But if you don't take Christ at his word, you'll remain in your sins. So our faith gets tried from the beginning. Just like Abraham's faith was tried when he knew in Isaac God would perform his promises that God had made to him. But then he tells him to offer him up. He knew God would reconcile it all. He knew God knew what he was doing. That's faith. God knows what he's doing. I'll close with this. You've heard it before, but I think it illustrates perfectly what we're talking about. A fellow in a circus, he's watching this fellow ride a bicycle across a tight wire about 60 feet above the floor or something like that. We've all seen pictures of that kind of thing. And before he started, the man said, do you believe I can do this? Everybody said, yeah, we believe you can do it. 
We came here to see it. And so he rides across. He rides back. Then he says, do you believe I can do that again? Everybody says, yeah, we believe you can do it again. Come up here and sit on, on, on the handlebars and ride with me. Now who had faith? All those people crying out faith. Yeah, we believe you can do it. We believe you can do it. How much do you believe I can do it? Sit on the handlebars and ride with me. You see, that's where the whole denominational world collapses in their concept of faith. It's not, that's not the faith of Abraham. You know what Abraham would have said? If that had been God telling him to do that, he climbed right up there and sat on those handlebars and ridden right across. That's the kind of confidence you have in God and God's Word. It's not just faith that God is and that God is who He claims to be. It's showing that faith in compliance with His will when it doesn't seem like such a thing can happen. Peter says, when he sees the Lord walking on the water, if it's you, Lord, bid me come to you. He said, come out there. Now, when did Peter's faith exhibit itself? Was it when he stood up in the boat? Was it when he swung his leg over the side of the boat? Was it when he swung the, his other leg over the side of the boat? When did his faith in Christ that he could do what Christ was doing demonstrate itself? Well, it suddenly weren't sitting in the boat and said, I believe you can do that, but I think I'll sit here. It was when he put all of his weight on his feet on that water. That's when he had the faith of Abraham. That's what God's asking us. When we know God exists, Christ is the Son of God, the Bible's the Word of God, these are the terms of salvation, we take him at his word. And we step out of the boat and put our full weight on the truth that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes of the Father but by Him. John 14, 6. And if ye love me, Christ said, ye will get up on the handlebars and ride across. Ye will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. If you're subject to the gospel call today, we hope you'll be honest with yourself and with God and His Word and take Him at His Word and obey the gospel. If as a child of God you have slipped, you don't take Him at His Word as to doing those things Christians are to do to be saved, we hope you'll repent, come confessing those sins and pray God for forgiveness. If you're subject, we ask you to come while we stand and sing.